Good evening, and welcome to another Sunday Night Thrive. I'm so glad that you can join me. What a fun night it's going to be as we take a look at two very opposite mindsets uh, this evening. So uh, let's not uh, let's not waste any time. Let's jump in with prayer and, and spend some time worshiping God together in prayer and song. Father in heaven, thank you so much for my friends, my family that have joined us tonight. And I pray you would be super blessed by uh, everything that takes place here. Lord, may your Holy Spirit prevail uh, over all of the proceedings this evening. And God, in that, do your perfect work. So Lord, now minister in this time, God, I pray. And thank you, thank you for what you're already going to, thank you in advance for what you're going to do, God. So this is your night. Be magnified and glorified in it, please. And minister to us. But first, may we minister to you. May we bless you in our hearts, in our praises, in our attitudes, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Draw me close tonight. Pour your spirit. Let me know your love, Jesus, Jesus. Open up my heart. Let my love pour out. Let
Jesus be exalted here tonight, tonight. Oh, Jesus be exalted here tonight. Lord, Please be exalted tonight as we seek to study your word. Be blessed with our pursuit. God, minister to us in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Grab your Bibles, friends. Well, you know, sometimes you just can't get that deep breath in, but thank you. Uh, I just love that we're family, so I can just give you what I got. We are in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 3, and let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Oh God, you are so good, and the ministry of your Holy Spirit and word upon us is so transforming, so transform us tonight. Teach us, equip us, correct us, challenge us, exhort us. Let us be in every way thoroughly equipped for every good work as you continue your work, your ministry, God. And for me as a pastor, as a teacher, may I edify and equip as you ordain me for me to do in Ephesians. And Lord, now I pray that your word would burst open and come alive for us. May we have so much fun in it. May we learn what we need to learn tonight. Minister to us, God, we pray now. In Jesus' name. Oh, and Lord, immerse me in your Holy Spirit. Come upon me. Pour into me your Holy Spirit to overflowing. And from that overflow, thou serve God, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. I would say tonight as I would any, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. Or as I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Amen. All right. Let's catch up. Uh, Moses is teaching us how to look back and learn from the 40-year history that we've seen here. Uh, And he's taken us back to Numbers 13, 14, where we said no to God's place for us. His place of fruitfulness, his place of abundance, his place of overflow. And so God gives us a tour. And it's a death march of 38 years to fulfill the 40 years, one uh, year per day of the days when the uh, spies searched out the land. But really, it's a museum of fulfilled promises of people of the like. Places where God has dropped the giants that were the incumbents uh, so that a people that he's promised would receive it. So uh, that's Esau with the Horites that had lived there. And each one kind of grows in its intensity to Moab, where we see the Emim that were numerous and tall as the Anakim, which were the people that had caused such great fear of the report in Numbers 13 and 14, to Ammon with the Zanzuming. And the Zanzuming, I mean, I mean, how could that not be fearful just to saying the name? Ooh, I think I scared myself. Uh, great and numerous and as tall as the Anakim, as we saw with the other group as well. And so God continues to grow this idea of that if, if God could take down these giants, for, the, for Esau, uh, for Moab, for Ammon, who in essence were distant relatives to the nation of Israel. Now it's your turn. So he starts by having them cross the river as a rehearsal. Uh, and this is back to verse 24, a previous chapter where it says, Rise, take your journey and cross over the river Anon. Look, I have given into your hands Sihon, the Amorite king of Hezbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. God says, all right, now it is time. You've seen now three nations that I have dropped the giants to give them the land. Now it's your turn to start dropping the giants so you can enter in 
to get to drop the giants to get the land but first you cross the river just like you will to cross the jordan to be able to claim the land i've given you so it starts with uh this king sihon moses though having seen what happens when you just sort of talk peace with people and try to pay for the for your accommodations he tries the same thing here with sihon but the lord hardens the guy's spirit so that they would really start to learn how to become an offensive nation they came and they fought at Yahaz and took all of his cities. The end result of that was a, a, a complete and absolute victory. So then God brings him to the next place uh, of Bashan with King Og. I mean, how can a giant not, I mean, how can a guy named Og not be a giant? Uh, and they take him and his, nations to, his nation to battle in Adrai and all of Argob region, that's 60 cities. And we see this growth again with high walls, gates, bars, and even the rural townships are taken. And that's kind of where we kind of bring things into where we're at here. But I wanted to kind of point out that now Sihon and Og's territory has been conquered. And that area is roughly about 2,200 square miles. To put that into perspective, that's roughly half of all of Los Angeles County. And so, though God tells us that, in essence, was a dress rehearsal, a preseason warm-up, and really what God wants to develop is a buffer zone on the east side of the Jordan, uh, but it's plush, it's verdant, the pastures, and there were high-walled cities. And so, all Generation 2 knew was wilderness and stories of Egypt and people wanting to go back there. So, you can imagine that's what they're looking at, and they're standing in this verdant territory, and with that, verse 12, and that takes us into our text. And this land, as we're reviewing, which we possessed at that time from Aurora, which is by the river Anon, remember the river they had crossed, and half the mountain of Gilead and its cities I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites. This is not a commendation. This is a reminder. This goes back to Numbers chapter 32, where we read that now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock. And when they saw the land of Yetzer and the land of Gilead, that uh, indeed the region was a place for livestock, they ultimately speak to Moses, Eleazar, and the leaders of the congregation. And they say, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession, and don't take us over the Jordan. Uh, and I, there's a couple of things that kind of stand out. And again, this is all for review, but there is a theme he's going to be working with here. And consider this. These are people that are talking to God about how they miss the meat and they're starving to death. And yet this particular, uh, these particular two tribes are very wealthy with a multitude of livestock. What gives? There's a couple things to consider. And it would be the same, to be honest, if you were in India. And that is that if you had a multitude of cows and you were starving, you still wouldn't kill them because they were considered sacred to the culture. Uh, there and I just wonder if these people are looking and they've complained to to, to Moses and to Chron because they were hungry and yet here they are with an awful lot of cows to kill. Nonetheless, they take a look and they're like, "We really just want this is good enough for us." And and we can look at our own lives to be honest, and we see the trajectory that we're on from where we've come from, and. It is a profound and brilliant thing for God, for God to continue to take us forward in our walk with Him. Uh, and, and in that, I think in my own life, going from a place of, of poverty and of madness to a place of, of moving forward in university, moving forward to California, moving forward to London. And I look in every one of those cases, how God has taken me and moved me forward in my walk with Him. But also things just keep getting better. And here's the danger the moment you say, this is good enough. And the danger is you cease to move forward from that point. And that becomes a really rough thing the older we get. Because sooner or later, somewhere down the line, we know that every battle becomes a bigger battle the moment we take a step forward than it used to be. But we, it's easy to forget that it's God who's going to battle for us and sim simply calling us to come and pick up the spoils, if you will. And, and this, this two, first of all, these two tribes, Reuben and Gad, 
they're looking at this territory and on the other side are these battles to be fought but they're also they don't know i mean and, and i remind you the spies you know 38 years ago had said this is everything god said it was genesis 12 1 he said it was a land god would show him by exodus 3 8 he called it a land that's good large flowing with milk and honey and would reiterate that in exodus i believe it's 33 3 god had promised that the land was a flourishing land, but all they really knew was the wilderness. And much of that was the Negev, was the, de was the desert. So now they're finally seeing something that looks a bit like an oasis, like that brief moment they had before by the palm trees. And, Elam, and in that, uh, Elam, and they look at that and they're like, I, I don't even have to imagine better. This is just good enough. And I don't want to be that person that ever just kind of rests on a good enough when my God is infinitely great and he has this, he riddles the Bible with stories of people as they get older, seeing the best work of God in that ministry. And I, I just, there's just so much more land for God to conquer and places to explore and great things to see as we continue to move forward. And what we could sometimes miss is that we're going to go, we're going to continue to, the wheels are going to continue to spin. It's just the direction we point the wheel that it's going to, the direction it's going to move. Uh, consider Lot back in Genesis 13, when he lifted his eyes, saw the plain of the Jordan that was well watered before, uh, before him. And this shepherd ultimately finds himself in a city, which was completely no place for sheep. For that matter, no place for a shepherd and no place for a godly man. Uh, that was going to simply be a thorn in the culture and not a, a world changer. So the request of these two tribes, and God makes clear it's two tribes here. Don't take us over. And Moses erupts at this and he goes, this smells so much like Numbers 13, 14 with me. And, and, and again, I'm just continuing to ask myself, is good good enough for me? when a God is a God of infinitely great and awesome. What Moses knew from Numbers 13, 14 was that fear is contagious. And he knows that this kind of thing is a contagion. And these people are like, can we just do this? And Moses here isn't reviewing that whole interplay with him. He's just simply saying, and he's, he's listing it in order. He's saying that these, this area has been given to these two tribes. Verse 13, it says, the rest of Gilead, Remember, there was a portion of it to the north. And all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, and I have given half the tribe of Manasseh, and all the regions of Aragab with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. Ya'er, uh, sorry, Ya'ir, the son of Manasseh, took the region of Aragab as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Ma'akathites, uh, and called Bashan after his own name, Havoth Ya'er, which is like the villages or village of Ya'er to this day. And I also gave Gilead to Machir. Now, notice the order here. It started with two tribes going, hey, could we just do this? Could we just stay here to now a th half of a third tribe? Now this mindset, this sentiment has split another tribe in half. And half of that tribe has adopted this particular perspective that this is good enough. Now, if we look through scripture... It is important to recognize God makes a special note about what is east and the concern when something comes from the east, it's just not good. And whether that be that Adam and Eve were, were driven out and remain east of Eden, or whether it be uh, the Babylon that will be east of Eden and how that will invade. And, and God, is, God will show us Assyria, which is east of Israel. And then he'll show us Babylon, which is east of Israel, and the challenges and the problems that those would be. And he talks about an east wind. He talks about how the, the locusts and things that have come from the east, excuse me, and in all of that, parking yourself farther east is parking yourself farther towards those very things that are dangerous, that are felonious, that are harmful. And I just wonder how many of us are are driven to whatever that east would be in our lives. Those things that God has great and good is enough for us. 
But what he tells us here is that a, a half of a tribe now has jumped in on this momentum. And in that, they went and said, you know, we'll do the same. So after Reuben and Gad got the okay, half of the tribe of Manasseh jumps in. Uh, and I ask myself, what example and momentum am I being a part of? That if people were to jump into it, would it be something that I would be thankful for? Or would it be something I'd be like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't follow my example. Now, Machir, who is a son of Manasseh, uh, by the way, Machir means to be sold. I, I don't know who names their child that, but it is important to note. I think it's fitting under the particular perspective here. Uh, from Numbers 32, I believe that's verse 39. Verse 40, it tells us that Moses gave Gilead to Machir, the son of Manasseh, as well. And Ya'er, verse 41 of that chapter, the son of Manasseh went and took small towns and called them Havroth. Ya'er, just as uh, we had seen. Now, it's important to note that Manasseh means to forget. We will see, first of all, with Moses, uh, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, with Joseph, as he names his child Manasseh for that purpose, because of all of the hardship that he went through with his brothers, getting this wife and having these children, how the Lord has caused him to forget all of his hardship because of the, the wonder of his family. And I, and I speak from, from that, uh, from experience, of how God can take and give you a beautiful family that is so precious and so beautiful that all of the hardship you ever went through that was once defined as family ceases to be a point anymore. And it's just forgotten. And this will become a very big issue when we get to the next chapter when God talks about what there is that we should not forget. <clears throat> with the light summary, God promised the land flowing with milk and honey. He said that he'd get them out of the previous, and he did. He said he'd bring them in, but not everybody wants in, and they'll say, here is good enough. And I must be attentive and watchful where almost would be acceptable to a world around me as still something good, but it'll never continue the progress God intends. Verse 16. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites I gave from Gilead as far as the river Anon, the middle of the river as the border as far as the river Yebok. Remember, that's where kind of started that whole uh, forward motion. The border of the people of Ammon, uh, and the plain also with the Jordan as its border from Chinaret. In Chinaret, I want to remind you, is the Sea of Galilee. It means harp, as far as the east side of the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea, uh, below the slopes of Pisgah. The east side of the Sea of Galilee, following it down the north from the north end of the to the north end of the Dead Sea, it basically chases it all the way down the whole Roman or the Jordan River. <clears throat> that particular territory, by Jesus' day, will be entirely Roman, and they will call it Ten Cities, or in, in the land, Decapolis. And that's where, when we read the Decapolis, that's where that is. This area that, remember, Israel is still functioning as Israel on the west side of the Jordan. On the east side of the Jordan, that's all Roman territory by the time of Jesus. And certainly infinitely earlier than that as well, just never reclaimed there. Verse 18, and that's today's Jordan, by the way, the nation of Jordan. And then I commanded you, at verse 18, then I commanded you at that time saying, the Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All your men of valor um, shall cross over, all you men of valor shall cross over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel, but your wives, your little ones, and your livestock. I know that you have much livestock shall stay in your cities, which I have given you, until the Lord has given rest to your brethren as to you, and they also possess their land, the land which the Lord your God is giving them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. And I have commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings, so will the Lord do to all the kingdoms through which you pass. You must not fear them, for the Lord, your God himself, fights for you. Moses now was reminding those two and a half tribes, now that they're at the border, if you will, preparing to cross the Jordan, though Moses knows he won't. 
And he knows that where they're at at this moment is home for those two and a half tribes. They're actually in their homeland, if you will, because of these choices that they've been made. They won't. And what God makes is a couple very important points here, beloved. Uh, one is even when you choose to say this good is good enough, even though God may have better if I were just willing to follow him beyond this, you're still going to wind up in the battles anyways. Uh, and that is kind of a really important note. If you're doing it to avoid battles, you might as well get the land that the battle's over anyways. Uh, and I just want to encourage you tonight, maybe you've hit a place of stagnance. Maybe you've hit a place where you're kind of like, I'm getting older, I'm slowing down. I just don't, I don't want to get more vision from God. I don't want to move forward. Well, my challenge tonight to you is let God continue to lead you forward because there will be a day when you will not be able to move forward anymore. And that will be the day you stand before him. And when that day comes, I believe every one of us will wish we had followed him further. Uh, and what we're going to see in the rest of this text here will be the complete opposite of that mindset. They're standing at the edge of the wilderness, border of the promised land, and it's so far greater than the wilderness behind them, but so much less than the world that is before them that they could have embraced. And they remember Egypt being their greatest foe, and they see the north, that of Canaan, being their biggest future challenge. But what they don't see is just to the east, Assyria and Babylon will be their greatest threats to come. But right now, these people are sort of settling in. But Moses says, I want to remind you, you promised with me that you would in fact go to fight with the nation. Matter of fact, he says, I'm going to put you on the front lines here. And with that, then you can come back when the battle's over and you can rest. And it's interesting because the nation of Israel will not take all the land promised them. But these two and a half tribes will go back to, um, to their land even when the battle's not done. Now, a couple quick notes and we'll get to the last portion of this. Uh, these two and a half tribes will cross the Jordan back into their home, their homeland again, east of the Jordan, today's land of Jordan. And when they do, they'll build an altar to try to remind themselves. This is Joshua 22. Uh, they'll build an altar with the intent of... Uh, of trying to make sure they remember what the altar was like in Jerusalem. The nation of Israel will see this thing, call it treachery, by the way, in Joshua, I believe it's 22, 12. Uh, and they gather together to go to war against them. And what they're saying in essence is, a couple of verses later, is we did this so that later on when we pass off the scene and the next generation comes in, and they're like, well, do we really have any part with that nation over there across the Jordan? They'll say, well, take a look at this replica altar. It's a witness that we're really kind of one people. And that's, it's sad when you have to prove to anyone that you belong to God's people. And I never want that for me. I never want to be in a place where it's even doubted. When I look at people that were very human, like for instance, David, uh, and I would ask anyone, do you believe that you'll see him when you're in heaven? And I don't believe there's much argument. But then we talk about his predecessor, Saul, and you ask, well, what about him? And the, there's a lot of doubt. Well, we hope so, maybe, hard to say, maybe not. Whether he is or not, from the perspective of witness, he's already a failure if you have to say that. And I never want to be that case where, where there's any doubt, whether not only whether I'm there, but whether I'm there just being the faithful, being, being, having concluded a life of faithful service. That's what I really want. Well, look at Moses at the end of this now in verse 23. Moses in his own personal testimony speaks with great regret then I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, Oh Lord God. Wait a minute, then I pleaded? Then after this land was allotted to these two and a half tribes? Because that makes us, that tells us that this is something that Moses is letting us into that we don't have recorded per se in the previous narrative. And he says, I pleaded with the Lord at the time saying, Oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness. The word is gadal. It means magnitude or magnificence. 
and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works or your and your mighty deeds? Now, notice the term here in verse 24, you've begun to show. What does he mean, begun to show? I mean, Egypt was, was at this point 40 years back. The carrying of them through the wilderness has been for those 40 years. So where's the beginning to show this magnitude, this mighty hand, this magnificence? Well, the only thing left to say would be that he's taken down these two kings. And now the momentum is shifting now towards taking the promised land. Now Moses sees God's power in these victories with God's people. And he starts to recognize in that, that God is now shifting his attention to taking this generation across the promised land. And Moses sees that momentum and seeks to insert himself into that momentum. But he has this great failure at Meribah from Numbers 20 verse 12. Uh, verse 25, he says, I pray, therefore, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. I've seen your patience. I've seen your provision. But I've also seen now your power in taking down these giants. And can I please, please, could I cross over? And there's got to be something. I don't, I don't know if you've ever considered it. Israel was supposed to enter into the promised land in Numbers 13. They, re they refuse to go and thus begin this march. And as they begin this march, Moses doesn't blow it until Numbers 20, which means that had the people gone in the promised land on the first generation, Moses would have gone with them. What an interesting thought. Could you see Moses? And by next chapter, he's going to kind of play this in a way that he's like, you know, because of you. I mean, you could see this, this thing he's having a hard time reconciling in regards to it. But God, knowing their failure before they would fail, knows all of this is going to happen. And here's Moses. He's going, I know you're merciful. I know you're compassionate. Could you please just let me go in? Let me slide. Verse 26. But the Lord was angry with me on your, on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me in this matter. Now, he's pled with him. And I just, I just love the fact that Moses is just, I mean, would you blame Moses for this? But notice he says on their account. God wasn't going to let me in on your account because God is teaching this whole generation through teaching them something critical through Moses. And one of the things that's important to recognize is Moses' calling, his ministry was only to get them to the Jordan. That was it. Ultimately, it will be Joshua's responsibility to take them over into the land God had promised them. In Galatians chapter 3, 24, it tells us that the law, which Moses would be the bearer of, the law was the tutor or is our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we're no longer under that tutor. There must be a changing of hands. Uh, Hebrews 8, 13 tells us about an old covenant, this covenant here, versus the new covenant of Christ, that when it says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. And Hebrews is written at a time just before the fall of the nation of Israel's Jerusalem in, in uh, AD 70. So you can see in saying, that there won't even be a temple to sacrifice those things in soon. Those things are ready to disappear. Now, the point is a simple one. There's, there's a couple applications to this. But the, the simple of it is that God ordains boundaries to ministries and says, this is, where, this is what I've called you to. And I think it's interesting because Moses is pleading with God and God's like, nope, nope, nope. And I just think that's interesting because I know another guy that did the same thing, but in regards to a physical limitation, and that's Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And in his case, he had this, he had two things that he seemed to be pleading with God. 
One of them was that he really wanted to minister to the Jews, but that was not where God had called him. That was a limitation that God forbade him. The other was that he wanted to be free from these physical maladies so that he could be free to minister more. And it would be a hard thing to reconcile, but I'd like you to consider that Moses, oh Moses that, that Paul said that he pled with God three times and God says, my grace is sufficient, Paul. My power is made manifest in your weakness. And somewhere in all of that, Paul understands, he's, and God's like, we're done with this. This is no longer, this is a non-negotiable issue. And what God is making clear to Paul is that I will be more magnified and your ministry will be more fruitful in your weakness than in your strength. I don't like that mindset, but I understand it. And because I understand it, I don't like it, to be honest. But I do want the more fruitful ministry. And even if that means that there are weaknesses placed or boundaries that are placed, it is imperative to recognize that I should be willing to embrace whatever God gives me for the greater fruitfulness. And yet, there's another aspect to it. And that is, of course, their names. Moses, Moshe means to be drawn out or to be pulled out or to get out. And that's, it all depends on the sort of perspective of the verb. On the other side of it, Yehoshua, Joshua, means God's salvation or the salvation of God. And so on one side of it, there's this idea of pulling yourself out or getting out. And on the other side of it, it's God's salvation. And I think that there is so, every other religion but Christianity is about you getting yourself out getting yourself out of that place of, of guilt and shame and such. Meanwhile, God wants to offer, you us, uh, offer us his salvation at the cross where my price and your price was paid. That everything that separates us from God was paid in full. But God does give us this in verse 27 to Moses. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes towards the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan, but command Joshua. It's his third mention already in these three chapters. And encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before the people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land, which you will see. So we stayed opposite. Uh, we stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Pisgah, from Numbers 21-20, um, was the place where there was the wasteland, that was the place where Balachim tries to uh, curse the people in 23. But here is where the battle of Sihon begins, where, he, where Moses tried to send for peace and Sihon would have none of it. It would started there at this place of Pisgah. It was the place where God says, now go forward, and Moses didn't go forward. But by Numbers 23, verses 18 to 24, where Balach is hearing the second prophecy of Balachim, he says, Belachim says in verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. And I just put those two things together for a moment. God had already said this was the case. And then Belachim enforces the fact that when God said he will do it, and the next thing actually Belachim says is, has he said it and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God will get the people over. However, Moses' ministry has to end on this side of the Jordan. Now, the great news is, after Jesus comes and manifests on earth, the great news is, Moses will actually make his way into the promised land via a board meeting that he'll have with Elijah and Jesus on the top of a mountain. So God is going to give that to him. So why would it be that God would take Moses up to the top of this place and show him something he couldn't have? to show us how desperate we should want the very thing that Moses wanted. Now Moses will ultimately get it through Christ. And that's the point. That Moses, could you imagine the anger of Moses for two and a half tribes that are like, this is good enough. And Moses is like, I'll take your land. I'll take the place that you were promised on the other side. And these people are like, this is good enough. And Moses is like, what is wrong with you? God has promised us a place infinitely greater than this. Man, what is wrong with you? And I just see the comparison here of what much of Christianity could look like if we're not careful. People that are like, I don't really want 
I just want to be pulled out like Moses. I just want to be pulled out of the bad relationships, the despondency, the depression, the anxiety, whatever the things are. I just want to be pulled out of those things. But I don't necessarily want to see the full salvation of God, including taking me to a place of fruitfulness and abundance where I serve from the overflow. Can I just be rescued from death, but not really live that abundant life you have for me? And hear the heart of Moses saying, are you kidding me? Go to the land. You can go. The, the Joshua has to take you in, but go in the land. Because your forward progress should not end just simply in the place where you've been pulled out of one bad situation or been pulled out of the emptiness of a, of a spiritual death, but to a place of spiritual abundance and fruitfulness. Okay, to bring this to close, beloved, we have, in the simplest sense, we have two examples. We have these two and a half tribes that are like, this is good enough. We're no longer in bondage. Though we are closest to the enemy, without a ministry intact, this is good enough. It's better than the wilderness we came from, and it's certainly better than the bondage that we left. This is good enough. And then there are those like Moses who are craving a place he can't even get into that we can. And what if we had the passion of Moses to want to go into this place where it's not just salvation, but it's deliverance. And deliverance isn't just from, I remind you, it's to. And God's like, I want to take you now to a place where it is full of life and color and vibrance and vivacity. A place where the world is changed by you being a part of it. And, and I just want to pray for every believer here tonight, myself included, that God would take us deep into this place where we would hunger to move forward every breath of our lives. And that in that moving forward, God would do a great work in our lives. But it would have to be first and foremost our pursuit of Him. Not just our happiness to not be in the bondage we were in. But if you've not accepted the gift of Jesus Christ tonight, I just want to encourage you, it is time for you to say yes. It is time for you to accept the gift that Christ gave at the cross where your guilt and my guilt and shame were paid. At His death, at His burial, where all the old wickedness and bondage of the world I lived in, the tyranny of my own sinfulness is laid to rest. And we're at his resurrection, all like the Bible promised. God gives us this new life. The question tonight is, will you say yes to him? Well, if so, would you pray with me? God in heaven, I confess to you I'm a sinner. And I stand before you guilty, ashamed. But I believe you love me and sent Jesus to die on the cross for my guilt and shame. Just like your Bible promised, he died, was buried, and on the third day rose again. And now I say yes. Yes to his death for my sin and shame, his burial for the old me to be left for good, and his resurrection that I be raised a new creation under the Lordship of Jesus, my Savior and Lord. So I say yes, confessing Jesus as my ransom, my Redeemer, and my resurrected Lord tonight. I am yours, in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, I pray for every believer, myself included, that we would want your very best and that we would be willing to move forward wherever you lead us, no matter how wild and fantastical the calling would be, but in faith that your best it should be our schedule, our agenda. Because you have it earmarked specifically for us. Let us walk in it, we pray. 
So give us that passion to pursue. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer tonight, I would love to be able to encourage you any way I can to uh, give you materials and whatever and come alongside and be praying for you. So if that's the case, we'll put up a slide in a moment for you to be able to uh, contact me where we can give you some materials. But having said that, what do you say we end with a song tonight? Then, let me see if I can do this really quick. Dun, dun, dun. Um, I've never tried to do something like this. And you don't even know what I'm doing, so it doesn't, it's not that big of a deal, I suppose. Uh, let me see. Can I? Suzanne? Yeah. Hi. My director, my producer. Uh, do you have a second song option there now? Uh huh. Okay. Wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. Okay, let me do this. Okay. Wow. Let's try that. It just makes sense having what where we've just gone with this. What a moment you have brought me to such a freedom that I have found in you. You're the healer that makes all things new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going. The past is over and you things are made new surrender my life to Christ a moving moving forward Ooh. you've risen with all in your hands you have given me a second chance hallelujah hallelujah yeah 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 oh yeah 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 oh
Well, Lord, even if my guitar doesn't want to move forward, I thank you that we still can. And thank you, God, for loving us so much that you would even, that you wouldn't bail on us, that you wouldn't say, this is enough. The most amazing thing to me, God, is that you still want to keep moving us forward and we still keep wanting to stop. Well, Lord, thank you that you call us forward. And tonight, God, give us that willingness to step forward at whatever you want to do there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, saints. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you another night. And I already look forward to next week.